Philip Udish and Brad Pomerantz here in the Long Beach area, and we are joined by Roberto Uranga. He is a Long Beach City Councilman, and recently the voters of Long Beach were asked to pass an increase in the city's sales tax. Measure A would increase the sales tax by 1% for six years, a half a cent for the f final four years. That means that our sales tax in Long Beach would be 10%. Were the voters generous? Uh, well, actually, they invested in their city. Uh, by they were 1%. generous. They, we were generous uh, because it is an investment in the infrastructure. Uh, we're going to be using it to fix our streets, fix our alleys. Uh, fix our uh, infrastructure in, in terms of what we need to have done. So what's interesting about this measure, as you know, in order to pass a tax where the funds are dedicated, mm -hmm. the voters need to pass it by two thirds. Mm -hmm. In order to pass a tax where it's general, the voters need to pass it by 50% plus one. Right. In the instance of measure A, the city council decided to go for a general tax, right. so you needed 50% plus one. You got almost 60%. And that, that is a very telling story there in the fact that the city of Long Beach and the residents do believe in the city. They, right. they, they love their city and they want to invest in the city. I find it interesting that we have a system that is fashioned that way because if you think about it, one would think that if the voters know exactly where the money's going to go, mm -hmm. the threshold should be lower. Mm -hmm. If they're not sure, maybe the threshold should be higher. Mm -hmm. But under California law, it's the reverse. Well, I think what uh, helped uh, allay some of those fears is the fact that we are going to be setting up an oversight committee right. uh, consisting of residents uh, who will be looking at the projects as they come along and knowing and seeing how we spend our money. And Measure B also I thought was interesting yeah. because under Measure B, which also passed, the city is required to put aside 1% mm -hmm. of the additional Measure A funds into a city rainy day fund. Right. So that's uh, good uh, politics, if I may say. Well, you know, again, it's an investment in the city. We're looking at a rainy day fund so that uh, we don't get into the deep uh, deficits that we did in prior years, so this, this is good. So where will that money go? You said a bit, but give us a better sense of where the money will be spent. Well, we have a lot of city, a lot of streets right. that are very at the threshold of uh, being just total loss. Uh. So we need to fix those. Uh, we have alleys that are uh, dirt that need to be paved, and we have other ones that are ready to collapse as well. Of course, we have our infrastructure in terms right. of uh, piping and, and water and gas that need to be uh, strengthened and, and reinforced. We have buildings that need to be uh, reinforced as well. So we're looking at uh, projects that are going to make the city better, uh, more uh, friendlier. Uh, we've got some uh, traffic lights that need to be replaced. So we have our lighting system that we need to go up with the LED lights all sure. over the city that we need to look on. I guess almost $50 million annually will come right. in. When can we expect these projects to go online? Do we know? Well, uh, the, we're not going to be getting the, the revenue until J January 1. That's, ah, when, that's when it kicks So it takes in. some time. So we're, we're probably looking at the, the first project to be kicked off in about two years, uh, 2018. What I also thought was compelling about this vote is at the same time that the city was asking its voters to pass a sales tax, the city college was asking Long Beach City voters for a bond, mm -hmm. $850 million, right. which is a big amount of money. That bond also passed actually by a slightly larger margin. Right. You know, we hear about concerns when you there are too many taxing and bonding measures on a ballot that the voters will just shut it all out and vote mm -hmm. no, but not this time. Yeah. Not in this city. Right. I mean, Why? Be specific, well, sir. Well, you Why? know, I, I've been saying it. Uh, right. The residents of Long Beach love their community. They love Long Beach. They love to see it grow. They like to see it be the best city that it can possibly be. And, it, and that includes helping our educational system. And you, before you were a city council member, were on the Long Beach Community College right. District. So, right. yeah, you had a rooting interest probably <laughs> in both. Of course. Of course. And, and Education is important. But were you surprised that both measures basically hit around 60 percent that that's not really close uh i was more surprised about measure a than measure lb a, uh, a being the sales tax increase right i mean lb was 
the city loves their educational system. I they love education. So I was not surprised about that one. Pleasantly surprised about the Measure A that it won with the, uh, the, measu with the uh, uh, percentage that it did. I want to shift gears and speak about your membership on the California Coastal Commission. Oh, my. Oh my. It's been a bumpy uh, 2016. <coughs> yes, it has. Just to give our viewers some background, we know that the executive director was removed by the Coastal Commission. It was tremendously controversial. I believe you voted in favor of removal. Mm -hmm. um, that turned the Coastal Commission into a focal point for controversy. Mm -hmm. Some folks felt as if that move was a pro-development move. I don't even want to go there. <laughs> Where I would like to go, though, is talk about measures that are percolating in the legislature dealing with communications. Mm -hmm and how and whether outsiders can speak with coastal commissioners. Mm -hmm. what are the, what's the law right now? Okay, those are uh, ex parte. Right. And the ex parte system was created, obviously, long before I got there. Right. And it was because of the previous commissions were having uh, a, a free hand at being able to meet with developers and lobbyists and uh, environmentalists to talk about projects that were pending before the commission. Uh, got out of hand. Right. Uh, there were some uh, issues regarding uh, uh, donations and, and right. those types of, of activities. So the ex parte system was created to document that any time a, a commissioner was contacted by either a lobbyist, a developer, or an environmental uh, agency, that they would be transparent in saying and divulge what they talk and, and talk about it. And divulge it. What, what did they talk and about? So, and what so they that's they the law now. Yes. And, you know, one could argue as long as there's sunshine, that everyone should feel as if there's transparency. Right. The problem, though, as I understand it, is there uh, may be some commissioners that don't always divulge the ex-party communication. Well, you know, I can't speak for my fellow right. commissioners, but I know in terms of myself, I, I have an open-door policy when it comes to ex parte. Right. Anybody wants to talk to me about a project, whether it's a, a developer, a lobbyist, or an environmental uh, organization, they're free to call me and have a meeting and talk about it. Uh, the, the, the biggest uh, advantage or opportunity mm -hmm. that we have with the next parte is that we get to talk about a project before the commission. Right. So that, before the commission meeting, so that we could get a clearer understanding of what the issues but are. But there's a move to ban yeah. ex parte communication. Yeah. That's unfortunate because uh, ex partes are, uh, are have a very important purpose uh, during commission meetings in, in regards to b getting the background on a project. The, uh, the proponents of the ban would say, you are acting, the commission, in a quasi-judicial fashion. Yes. And in court, you mm -hmm. don't really see ex parte communications with a judge mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that you see it with a commission like the Coastal Commission or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to those that would say, since you are quasi-judicial, you shouldn't have these ex parte communications? Yeah. Well, we are quasi-judicial, no question about that, because we do make decisions in terms of the, the merits of, of a project. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it functions differently because of the, these are projects that are coming before the commission that have uh, uh, an impact on the coast. Okay. And it's the impact on the coast is huge in regards to what it would have on uh, on ESHA, right. you know, environmental sensitive habitat areas. And couldn't one argue, uh, sir, that <coughs> without ex partes, you would be lacking certain information? I mean, right. only so much can be told to you in an open meeting. Right. I mean, I can only imagine how long the meetings would go if there are no ex partes. And, that, and that's the, uh, that's the uh, concern, is that our commission meetings will now be maybe extended to three or four, four days or five days so because of the need for more time to hear, to have these hearings. Is there a way to button up this system without, you know, throwing out the baby with the <laughs> bathwater? Is there a way to button this up? Uh, you know, we were, we were moving right along. Right. We were, the first year that I was there, that I've been there, we were moving right along smoothly. The controversy hit and then it brought up to, to the surface these other, right. these other supposed or, pr or right. perceived uh, issues with ex parte, and you know we were doing fine. Right. I mean, and, uh, so we'll see what happens. We'll have to wait and see. I mean, you know, I, of course, right now I'm still accepting ex parte right. because it's the law. Okay. Uh, once it becomes uh, prohibited, then we'll see what uh, happens. I, I will do that. Roberto Odonga is with us. I'm Brad Palmer. It's Charter Local Edition. I was.